Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. We have some great stories for you today. First, the judge in the trial of the Arizona rancher, George Kelly, has had enough with both the prosecutors and the defense attorneys. Richard Allen's attorneys don't want you to hear about his alleged confessions. That could be a problem. OJ killed by cancer. We talked about that yesterday. Hey, where are those attorneys today? And then our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. 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 Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Scott Reich, and welcome to Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased, true crime channel out there anywhere. All right, let's go ahead and do a couple of uh, housekeeping items before we get to the docket for April 12th. First, no trial in the Chad Day Bell case. They took today off. Um, the trial as it relates to George Kelly that we're gonna talk about here in a moment. So we are uploading those videos as soon as we can get them. Uh, at the end of the day. I know a lot of people really wanted to watch this trial and unfortunately it's uh, been delayed and we haven't been able to bring it to you live. So let's get to today's docket for April 12th, 2024. First, the judge in the uh, trial of the Arizona rancher, George Kelly, has had enough of both the prosecutors and the defense attorneys in this case. He walked out of the courtroom in the middle of the proceedings yesterday. The trial's in its third week, and Judge Thomas Fink has accused lawyers on both sides, the prosecution and the defense, of dragging out all of their oral arguments. Ladies and gentlemen, general rule, when you start repeating yourself, that usually means the conversation's over and you've got all you, and you've said all that you really had to say. Anyway, judge came back, the matter continues. Now, the jurors were taken to the uh, scene of the shooting outside of uh, George Kelly's 170 acre cattle ranch just outside of Nogales, Arizona earlier this week. That is where prosecutors say that Kelly shot and killed the uh, migrant who was uh, crossing illegally back in 2023. Now Kelly's defense team has argued that the lack of any gun residue indicates that the gun shots could have come from somewhere else. Now Kelly told police during the investigation that he fired warning shots in the direction of the group of the uh, people crossing illegally, but it was unclear if his shot was the death blow since no bullets were recovered at the scene. Now, George Kelly has not taken the stand as of yet, but his wife has testified. Now, obviously, uh, Mr. Kelly could face a life in prison sentence if he's convicted, given the fact that he's, you know, nearly 80 years old. Now, the defense has maintained that Kelly only fired warning shots into the air from his patio earlier in the day, and that his wife, Wanda Kelly, testified about dialing the Border Patrol ranch liaison upon spotting two armed men dressed in camouflage and carrying rifles and backpacks walking about 100 feet from their home. Now, the Kelly's defense team has um, obviously tried to raise reasonable doubt on whether the forensics uh, presented in court and the autopsy report can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, the man killed was actually by Kelly's gun. The fatal bullet was never recovered at the scene and a consultant for Kelly's defense team um, has stated that none of the state's witnesses in the trial thus far have provided any rebuttal testimony against the defense theory that a RIP crew, which is apparently a gang of bandits, sometimes cartel affiliated, actually filed the fatal shot of the deceased man and robbed him. Now, obviously, uh, George Kelly made some national news when he was arrested because he was held on a $1 million bond and charged with first degree murder. Uh, the charges were ultimately downgraded to the charge of second degree murder. But when you're 79 years old, it doesn't take a whole lot of time to spend a life sentence in prison. Anyway, Mr. Kelly rejected a plea deal from the prosecutors that would have allowed him to plead guilty to one count of criminally negligent homicide if, if he had pled guilty. He turned that down there in trial. The trial is expected to go through at least April 19th. So maybe wrapping it up sometime next week. It's got to be interesting, ladies and gentlemen, because the prosecutors say that Mr. Kelly shot at this person, that there was no imminent danger for Mr. Kelly uh, to justify shooting somebody on his property. Mr. Kelly and other people have raised self-defense throughout, which, like I said, you have to have immediate fear. 
But the defense theory has really turned into, we didn't shoot the dead guy. Uh, somebody else did. You can't prove that it was Richard Allen's rifle that hit the guy, and that's the one that ultimately killed him. I believe everybody that what, what I've seen is that they're saying that an AR-15 style type rifle, a 7.62 round, uh, was the uh, round used, but nobody knows for sure because, as I noted, the uh, round was not recovered in the decedent and it was not uh, found out in the desert. It's going to be interesting to watch, ladies and gentlemen. I think a lot of people have a lot of emotions about this particular case for their own reasons, and we'll just have to wait and see how it comes out. Next on the docket, Richard Allen's attorneys don't want to have the jury hear about his alleged confessions. That's right. You know, I, the joke oftentimes in our offices is why are we going to let the uh, facts get in the way of a great defense? And that may be what's kind of taking place in the Richard Allen's case. They got all this great stuff about this Odinist stuff and the, the police didn't do this and didn't do that. And they got a million things going. And, um, then they forgot one little thing. Oh, that's right. He may have confessed several times, not once, not twice, but multiple times. Now, like I said, it is um, alleged that Mr. Allen made uh, some incriminating statements to both inmates as well as correctional officers during his time uh, while he was waiting in prison for his uh, double murder trial to begin. And uh, needless to say, his attorneys want those so-called confessions suppressed uh, due to uh, claiming Mr. Allen was in a state of psychosis. Now, if you don't already know, Richard Allen is accused of killing 13-year-old Abby Williams and 14-year-old Libby German near the Monon High Bridge in Delphi, Indiana, back in February of 2017. Now, this case is scheduled to begin on May 13th after lots and lots of uh, legal maneuvering on everybody's parts. But we've covered that in other videos, and we're not going to do it today. So there have been reports that detailed how Mr. Allen reportedly admitted to killing the girls during a prison phone call with his wife. But his attorneys have repeatedly claimed that Richard Allen was under physical and mental duress at the time of his statements, and therefore they can't be trusted. But this wasn't the only time Allen allegedly made some incriminating statements. A new pleading reveals that Allen also reportedly made further confessions to guards and inmates during his stay at the Westville Correctional Facility. Now, Mr. Allen's attorneys are pushing for these confessions uh, to be suppressed. However, they stating in their motion that the uh, poor conditions Allen was kept in compounded his deteriorating mental health health state. And the defense attorney said these so-called confessions were the result of psychological and mental coercion illegally directed against the defendant and therefore were involuntarily given. Now, Mr. Allen's attorney said that their client was kept on suicide watch during the majority of his stay at the Westville prison and that he was exposed to some of the harshest conditions that even the most heinous of convicted offenders could not have endured. Now, it should be noted that the uh, judge, Francis C. Gull, felt that Allen was being treated actually better than most inmates during his stay at the Westville facility. Needless to say, the prosecutors are pushing back against Mr. Allen's claim that mental health duress um, was responsible for these statements by stating that uh, Mr. Allen didn't begin acting strangely, in, such as eating paper, until after his alleged confession to his wife on the phone. Now, once again, Allen's attorneys go on to claim that inmates were stationed outside of Allen's door to spy on him and keep logs of all of his actions, statements, and behaviors. The attorneys say at some point these prisoners were pulled and replaced by uh, correctional officers. Now, the alleged poor conditions he was kept in exacerbated Allen's mental state According to his attorneys and according to them, Allen was battling depression throughout most of his adult life. And during Mr. Allen's stay in prison, the attorneys claimed that Allen's medications were administered in a less than consistent manner and fashion as well. And the attorneys also pushed their claim of inmates and prison guards being in the prison tied to this Odinism. Uh, this claim is tied to the attorney's alternative cult killing theory. And uh, due to all these compounding factors, Allen's attorneys argued that any confessions their client made 
were not really confessions and they were not voluntarily made due to the toll uh, his captivity had on his mental health. The attorneys further argue that these reported confessions include Allen telling an inmate that he had molested Abby and Libby before shooting them in the back. The attorneys point out, however, that the autopsy of the victims doesn't support this allegation and the girl's cause of death being related to a sharp, blunt object, not gunshot wounds. Now, Mr. Allen also reportedly expressed sorrow to another inmate over molesting Abby, Libby, and others, which he specifically named, apparently. And again, the attorneys pointed out that these allegations, falsities of this confession by stating the autopsy, the girls was absence of any evidence that the girls were sexually assaulted near or prior to their deaths. So obviously the judge will have to decide. There usually is a hearing in open court as it relates to a motion to suppress. Once the defense raises the issue that in a confession was uh, obtained illegally by government actors, then the burden then shifts to the prosecution to prove by clear and convincing evidence that they were uh, obtained legally. Now, obviously the issue here is, was there any government action? Obviously an alleged confession to his wife uh, by Mr. Allen, no government action there whatsoever. Stating that inmates were stationed outside and took copious notes and then ultimately prison authorities did that as well. Uh, maybe government action if they can actually prove that but once again, it's not like somebody was beating Mr. Allen to the point where he's like, I'll say anything. My prediction is that this motion to suppress will be denied. This is a question of fact for the jury to decide the credibility of Mr. Allen, uh, the circumstances in which the alleged confessions were made, and the jury uh, needs to consider the source of the information. If it comes from inmates that's saying, oh, he did this, but there's no corroboration to back that up, clearly the prosecution may not call those witnesses at all if they don't believe that they are credible. So, you know, when it comes to jailhouse snitches, be very, very careful indeed. Um, lots of people have mental health issues, but they don't necessarily uh, start talking about it on the phone with your wife or with other inmates. Hence the uh, rule that everybody is told, keep your mouth shut. Don't talk about the facts of your case with anyone other than your attorneys, because anything you say to anyone can and will be used against you. That's right, including your wife. So we will have to see um, when <laughs> The uh, trial commences, but I anticipate we will hear all about this um, information at trial, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see uh, where it goes. My prediction, motion to suppress denied. Let the jury decide. All right, we learned yesterday that cancer killed OJ. I'm sure everybody slept a little safer at night uh, knowing that OJ was not roaming the streets for sure. But there was a lot of talk yesterday about it. And then obviously the question arises, hey, since it's been three decades, where were all of those attorneys um, that were involved in that particular case? And uh, what are they doing now? Are they alive or are they dead? Let's get into it. Obviously, as you know, um, <laughs> O.J. Simpson was acquitted of uh, uh, the death of his wife and her friend, uh, Ronald uh, Goldman. And um, like I said, at the time, it was a big, big deal. I remember listening to that trial literally every day when the trial was going on and it turned into an absolute circus. Well, who was leading the circus? Well, we have Judge Lance Ito, who's still alive, has retired from the bench, doesn't publicly talk about the case, but he did something that was somewhat unique, and that was to allow cameras in the courtroom, which is one of the reasons why I think it's taken so long to get cameras in the courtroom for lots of courts, because they didn't want it to turn into the O.J. Simpson spectacle circus that took place. Like I said, it was originally supposed to go, I think, four weeks. It went 11 months because the judge was like, yeah, let's have another hearing. And everybody kept playing it up, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. 
And then even yesterday, you hear stuff about the jurors that are saying, yeah, we knew we was all guilty, but we were just uh, getting back uh, as it related to the Rodney King beating. So Judge Ito, you're the one that really screwed this thing up. I hold Judge Ito responsible for the uh, nonsense. The other people we have to hold responsible, obviously, is the prosecutors in the case. First, Marsha Clark. Obviously, she uh, lost the biggest case of her life. She retired from the district attorney's office after that and began a media and entertainment career. She co-authored a book about the trial titled Without a Doubt, and she appeared as a commentator on many of the networks. Christopher Darden, remember him? That's right, lost the biggest case of his life. Also left the DA's office after the Simpson trial, and he went on to teach as a uh, member of the faculty at the Southwestern University School of Law and appeared as a legal commentator over the years on uh, many of the networks. Now, Mr. Darden has uh, also written and spoken extensively about the Simpson case, and he has maintained his belief that OJ is, in fact, guilty. Next, Johnny Cochran. Remember Johnny Cochran, the lead counsel? If the uh, glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. That's right. Well, he died of a brain tumor at the age of 67. Robert Shapiro still has a, a booming criminal defense practice, has lots of high profile clients, and uh, also a very successful uh, businessman. He has started LegalZoom.com and RightCounsel.com. F. Lee Bailey, a man that I have personally met myself, really nice boy, he kind of blew it in the end. Anyway, during the trial, Bailey was recognized as probably the most famous uh, of all the attorneys, and he did the cross-examination of the uh, detective Mark Furman at the time, who was called to testify regarding his discovery of the bloody glove at the Simpson estate. Now, uh, F. Lee Bailey was disbarred in Massachusetts and Florida back in the early 2000s for misconduct regarding handling a client's case and later died in June of 2021 at the ripe age of 87. Robert Kardashian, this was the friend of O.J. Simpson. He died of esophageal cancer back in 2003 at the age of 59. But uh, his wife, Kris Kardashian, or Jenner, or whatever it is now, Kardashian, um, had a couple of kids, Courtney, Kim, Chloe, Rob. That's right, keeping up with the Kardashians, that Kardashian guy. Alan Dershowitz, former Harvard law professor. I think he's like an emeritus law professor these days. Uh, but he was also one of the lead attorneys for the O.J. Simpson case and uh, helped get the acquittal. He is now 85 and uh, still in the headlines and just recently re represented a former President Donald Trump in the impeachment trials. It is curious to note that um, Mr. Dershowitz always states that he has never voted for Donald Trump, but that he will represent anybody in need. Barry Sheck, remember, he was the DNA guy. He's the one that uh, kind of uh, raised controversy regarding the DNA collection during the investigation and to whether it was uh, valid or contamination, or yes, even planted by the police. Now, um, he and his uh, fellow uh, team member, Peter Newfeld, co-founded the Innocence Project back in 1992, which uses DNA evidence to exonerate people who are wrongfully convicted. And uh, that particular project has been pretty successful and helped over 300 convictions to be overturned as a result of what is it usually? That's right, oh, lying police officers and faulty identification. Mr. Sheck is now 74 and still teaches at the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law in New York. His uh, uh, law partner, Peter Neufeld, obviously played a key role as well as related to the uh, blood trail between Nicole Simpson's uh, body and um, blood sounded O.J. Simpson's car. Uh, once again, Neufeld is the co-founder of the Innocence Project and uh, still practices law in New York. So it's funny, all those people that were older when I was younger are now old. As I get older, like I said, it, it was called the trial of the century. And obviously, other than maybe like the Scopes Monkey trial, but that wasn't televised. 
It probably was the trial of the century at that time. There are certain things you can ask people. Where were you when JFK was killed? Where were you when the space shuttle blew up? And where were you when the O.J. Simpson trial uh, was announced? I can tell you, I was at the office that I was working at as a uh, law clerk at 1801 Broadway. And uh, we all gathered around a TV to watch the verdict and to say that we were stunned would be an absolute understatement. But that is the legal system. As a pet owner, you want to give your furry friend the very best. That's why baked in Colorado CVD infused dog treats are the perfect choice. These delicious treats not only taste great, but they also provide a wide range of health benefits for your pet. CBD has been shown to have many positive effects on dogs, including reducing anxiety, alleviating pain and inflammation, and improving overall wellness. Baked in Colorado's treats are infused with premium, full-spectrum CBD oil, meaning your pet will benefit from the whole plant extract. Not only that, but Baked in Colorado's treats are made with all-natural human-grade ingredients so you can feel good about what you're giving your pet. They're also free from wheat, corn, and soy, making them a great option for dogs with food sensitivities. Baked in Colorado CBD-infused dog treats are the perfect way to support your pet's health and well-being. With various flavors, including peanut butter, pumpkin, and bacon, your dog will love them too. So why wait? Head to www.bakedincolorado.com today and order your dog a bag of these delicious and nutritious treats. Your pet will thank you for it. All right, finally today, our dumb criminal. Please meet Richard Anthony Daniels. Now, Mr. Daniels was arrested outside of his home um, in the Crane Landing neighborhood in Florida following an alleged attack. Now, detectives allege that Daniels got into an argument with a man he tried to uh, or had hired to build his swimming pool. Daniels reportedly asked the man to leave his home, but the uh, affidavit states that the contractor said, I was hired to be here and I'm not leaving. Well, apparently then Mr. Daniels then knocked the ball cap off of the contractor. The hat fell into the pool. Mr. Daniels then went into the home and retrieved a baseball bat and the uh, came back and hit the contractor in the head with the baseball bat. Needless to say, the contractor uh, left, and he left with a big bump on his head, apparently, and some bruises. Uh, then he uh, went to the hospital and is, uh, has some sort of uh, head injury and is now suffering from migraine headaches. Needless to say, Mr. Daniel was now uh, faced with a charge of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, and uh, he was released uh, from jail yesterday after posting bond. Now, Mr. Daniels, did state that there's another side to this story, which he plans on sharing very, very soon. So I guess it's good that he waited to share his story till he talked to the police so that he'll have that evidence at trial. But needless to say, hitting somebody with a baseball bat, even on your property in Florida, reasonable. Would a reasonable person do that? I don't know. Anyway, Mr. Daniels, you are our dumb criminal of the day. All right, that's all we have for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for watching. We appreciate you. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next week. And remember, the Constitution matters. Yeah.